we've got a great topic today that we want to jump into. And I know the preamble was kind of long, but I think worth it for the people. Maybe if only one person heard that and changed their it's life. It's worth it. It is worth it. Um, so I got to tell you, I found this article that I really, really loved. And it was basically warning signs. Boo, 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 boo. Warning signs, guys. <laughs> Warning signs of a codependent relationship. And I thought this was like, I, I mean, when I read this and I go, man, did Christina Dennis write this? Right, right. Well, you know, it is my heart. Um, you know, I found out very early into my recovery from substance abuse that I was a raging codependent. And ever since then, because it gave me the gift, recovering from codependency gave me this gift where I have beautiful relationships and I have so much help and support and I actually live my own life. It is, I'm going to be the Pied Piper of recovery from codependency for the rest of my life. It's that important. Mm -hmm. It is that important. And you know, the interest, I always say the black belt of alcohol and drug recovery is codependency recovery because it is. like you always say, Christina, it's rare that you ever find somebody that's in recovery that hasn't struggled with some sort of codependent relationship. And that's what I want to talk with you about today. How do you know? Like, how do you know if you're, if you're listening to this podcast and you're saying, you know, like, well, Sorry, got bumped there a little bit. There um, you are. So how how do you know if you're in a codependent relationship? How do you know? What um, are the warning signs? Oh, there's so many. And I really enjoyed the article that you sent me. And I think that's that is super important. And first of all, I want to let, I mean, we did the article on this show about 90% of relationships are codependent. And there are several types of codependency. So if you've been confused about the definition, <laughs> I think it's really, really, you know, possible that we don't all the, uh, the whole group of people that focus on this don't exactly know. Um, they, okay, wait, wait, you got to back up here. 90%, 90%, 90%, 90%, because wow. it comes from our childhood. And we as a society continue to grow with mindfulness and we continue to grow with understanding. You know, we are not necessarily fighting for our lives in this country, thank goodness. And so we have the time to start looking and saying, why are people living unfulfilled life? Why are there these certain subtypes of people? You know, in alcohol, because codependency is a term that came from AA actually, and it's originally spoke of one person, you know, being kind of um, not being actually having their definition defined by a identified patient or an alcoholic, right? It was the person that was helping the alcoholic not hit a bottom. It was the person that was living for the alcohol. Uh, like to recover. And that's where the original term came from. But since then, we've really discovered it. And if you Google, happen to Google what types of codependency are there, you'll get different articles with different things. But for me, it is when your definition comes from other people and uh, when you put your needs and wants on. And the important yeah. thing is not necessarily what you do, but why you're doing it. And, you know, a codependent can look passive, they can look assertive, they can be anorexic, but it's the way we relate to other people and what we expect out of our relationships. So, okay, I got to, I, I have to, I have to interject here real quick. I'm sorry, Christina, to cut you off. That's but okay. one, I wanted, I wanted to let everybody know that on screen, uh, we're, we're also looking at, if you're listening on the podcast, this is from, I want to give credit to Fort Behavior uh, Health who actually wrote this article. And we're going to put a link actually in, in, in the podcast so everybody can access this article. But I have to, I have to ask you real quick, when, when you're dealing, Christina, with people that are, have codependency, when they come to you, are they shocked? Because a lot of the people I know that you work with specifically, they're in recovery. Like they're doing right. the deal. They've got right. years. So are, are they just like blown away? They're like, what? I like, Many. do they just discover it's like, wow, I'm, I'm in a codependent relationship. Many, many. And what's interesting is they often think it's the other person who's the codependent. <laughs> it's not that. Wow. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, so they come and they think, well, it's not, it's, it's, it's not that. So what, what are these warning signs, Christina? What well, are, do you know, it's like, if like, sure. wow, I've got a problem with this. Sure. Well, I think the most blaring one that everybody can identify is people pleasing and, you know, what that looks like. It is, you know, uh, 
subjugating your needs for somebody else's needs. It's the person who comes in and says yes to everything. It's the person who will not think if you ask them, where do you want to go to dinner? They can't make that decision. They say, well, where do you want to go to dinner? Because wherever you want to go, I want to go. And it's true. And it's actually part of sometimes the romantic comedy scene. If you think about it, you know, I remember a scene in The Runaway Bride where she didn't know what type of eggs she liked because she always said her whoever her partner was, that was her favorite way of eggs. And they show a scene of her trying on and eating eggs and deciding this is what I like. And that seems so silly, but it's really pervasive and it really stills our life and joy. So if you notice that your nervous system depends on how much you can please the other ones and other people around you, if you're over volunteering, if you're saying yes to everything yes. and then secretly being resentful, that's what people pleasing looks like. Yeah, if you know this whole thing of having this feeling that I have to kind of morph into whatever, what people want. Right. I think that that's interesting because I think everybody's had this to it. Look, peer pressure. If you don't get this in junior high or elementary school, right? You probably did this feeling of like, I don't belong. So I'm going to have to morph into whatever people yes. want, but it's even beyond that, isn't it? It's like, I get my joy from making sure that that happens, right? Like so true. that is, that's different than just trying to get along to go along. I get my worth from other people's opinions. I get my worth from making you happy. And that is dangerous because obviously we have codependency or dependency on somebody else reacting a way that we decide or think that they will like. And that brings us to our second point, which is lack of boundaries. Now I am the mm. boundaries girl. I have a room in recovered life discussions where we literally talk about setting healthy boundaries every week because our world isn't set up for us to have boundaries. Parents don't have boundaries with children. Children are not told or taught how they can have their own boundaries. Yeah. We don't have boundaries at work and we rarely have boundaries with our loved one. And one of the exercises that I've been taught is literally just touching yourself and visualizing, touching your face, the top of your head and realizing that you actually take up space, just you. And boundaries, I mean, it can be a lifelong lesson, but when we start with little boundaries, I mean, many of the people I work with don't aren't even comfortable with saying, no, I'm too busy or no, I can't do that. They're not even comfortable with that. And so they're basically being ran over and ran through and, you know, they don't understand that it's their motive, right. To be liked. It's their motive to make sure that other person's happy that keeps them behaving this way. And so one of the first things we work on is setting up boundaries, boundaries for ourselves, setting up boundaries for other people. And we can do it in a loving way. So mm -hmm. if you feel like nobody listens to you, nobody cares what you're thinking, that you have to say yes to everything, you probably have lack, lack boundaries. Yeah. You know, I see this a lot, especially with the 20 somethings that I work with, right? Because a lot of the times when they first get sober, the people around them, like you find any alcoholic behind them, you'll find two or three codependents that are feeding off that alcoholism. Including right? the alcoholic. Yes. Including the alcoholic. Yeah. And a lot of the times it's like, you know, uh, sometimes in setting these boundaries, a lot of times it's like, you know what, maybe you don't need your parents' help. Maybe you don't need your friend's help on this. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be able to fill the void of uncomfortableness. You need to just be uncomfortable. Right. You should be uncomfortable because it's the situation you're in. Maybe you can't have people save you on this. Maybe you need to do this yourself, right? Like, and it's str it's starting to kind of find those boundaries and where you can apply them in your own recovery. Right, right. And that's such, I mean, we could talk about boundaries forever, I promise you. And people would be surprised how we don't even have a society set up for healthy boundaries. But that brings us to the next point, the signs that you may be in a codependent relationship, which is lack of self-esteem or poor self-esteem. And that is one of the reasons why we are depending on everyone around us to define us, you know, mm -hmm. uh, self. And here's the tricky part. Codependents can look very boisterous. They can look like leaders. They are leaders in a lot of ways, but they are dependent on the people Ref reflecting back to them their worth. They don't have their own self-esteem. And a lot of codependents, I mean, we start with simple questions like, what's your favorite color? 
because they haven't thought about themselves in so long that they don't have yeah. a defined self-esteem. They just don't, they, and it's very poor, whatever they have. And if somebody, I remember thinking, you know, back in my teenage years that I was so dependent on somebody making and giving me a compliment uh, once a day. And if they didn't, I had a horrible day. And I love that you brought up the teenage years because a lot of this stuff really comes to full bloom. However, most of our codependent tendencies, we learned even pre-verbal. Yeah. What, what about this whole caretaking thing? Because, you know, the whole thing about being a caretaker, it, it kind of, I, I know a lot of people who before they found out that they were codependent and recovered from that, were in a caretaker role 24 7 3 six. it's what yes. they did for a job yes. it's what they did and now that they're out they're like not as comfortable with that right and i know some people that have even switched careers because they're like you know what this isn't healthy for me because they're prone to just always be the rescuer always be the mm -hmm. person that's caretaking right right and they don't have the ability to have boundaries or so caretaking looks like taking care of everybody's needs like and that might sound the same as the first three but it's going that extra mile thinking about you know what do they need and it's actions now i have a high support needs son so part of my role was to be a caregiver uh, beyond what a parent would normally do so it was very difficult for me i might call that the olympics of codependency with children and their parents and i definitely had to struggle against that but caretaking is one you believe the other the person is it capable and that's very very dishonest you know very un i mean you need that person to remain sick in order for you to have a role and two you um you really don't ever take care of your own needs because you have this silent invisible contract that they're supposed to take care of your needs and that is what i found out about caretaking and so i don't mean and i don't want people to stop taking care of other people much you know, a hundred percent. This has to be dwarfed and, and molded into an area that works. But the first thing that I do when I'm working with somebody is teach them or make them commit to taking care of themselves first. Yeah. Then what they have left over is available to other people. Well, you know, we find this in coaching a lot too. We find this just in general. It's like, if you're working harder than the person that you're working with, like to help get them sober or to whatever that that's a that's a recipe for disaster yes you're not actually helping them <clears throat> the next the next one that they bring up which is reactivity and this is kind of the dirty little secret of codependency and codependence if you're a massive codependent we know that we have reactions that are over the top we also know that if we care like you just said care more about what somebody's outcome is than they do we are reacting to something and what we want to work with is is respect responding rather than reacting, not having an emotional tornado go through us if, some, if someone we love is struggling. We just had an entire discussion about how the struggle is part of the deal. But when we are reacting, sometimes we want to prevent somebody else's growth. And so if you have, even if you have them way deep down inside, there's a certain amount of resentment and you're not giving out of your heart. If you expect a reaction, if you expect a response from your partner or your child, then it isn't, it, you're not reacting, you're not responding, you're reacting. And relationship stress is a real sign of this, right? If you're constantly in relationship, if there's constant drama all Absolutely. the time, there might be something not right there. There, <laughs> right. Well, nobody would come to me if they didn't have relationship stress. So you definitely exactly. want to take the time to look at this within yourself and see, you know, I, like we said, 90%. And as you are in recovery, it's, it's kind of the next step for you to evolve spiritually and to have that kind of relationship that's interdependent. Okay, Christina. So if we've heard all this and we're thinking, you know what? Wow, we've got this dependency. We've got this lack of self-image. We've got like all this other stuff. What do you do? Like if you buy, if, if people are listening to this right now and they're saying, wow, uh, this is uncomfortably, this is me. Yes. <laughs> what, what do you, what do you, what do you, what do you do if you feel that you're in this situation? First, I want to tell people one, give yourself some grace. It's okay. You got help getting there. 
<clears throat> you were raised by codependency. You have parents that are codependent. You have teachers that are codependent. It is actually very normal that you feel like you're in a codependency relationship or you are a codependent. So give yourself grace. Second, recognize that you are your first responsibility is to you. So come up with a plan. And I usually come up with a plan for people on how to negotiate relationships now that you're no longer going to act codependently to them, to start to learn about yourself and to start figuring out where it came from because you have old belief systems that no longer serve you. And that includes everyone on the planet. You know, I don't even think that the most evolved person you know, Deepak or Oprah would say that they have walked through their entire belief system and have addressed it, but they're sneaky, those belief systems. Mm -hmm. So work with somebody and figure out how to root them out and be kind to yourself. Love that. I love that. You know, and I think one of the ways to also do this, what I've seen is just having the conversation with people. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's what this recovered life thing is all about. It's just having that high next level conversation with people to be able to say, hey, you know what? I, I don't feel like something's right here. Right. And I, I love it. Like through discussions, really, I think we become aware of what's actually going on with us as we start to talk with other people about what's going on with them. Mm -hmm. We start to kind of get insight on what's going on with us. We are so much more alike than we are different. Um, and it's very interesting that the first thing we look for, and this I learned from Brene Brown's book, and it's the paradox of life. The more, the first thing we look for in other people's vulnerability, and it's the last thing that we show them. And so getting good and dirty in these kind of conversations and talking to people, getting to the truth mm -hmm. is what's going to set you free. Keep the conversation going. Join Recovered Life, a community of like-minded people who are looking to live their best recovered lives. Membership is free, and you can apply at recoveredlife.us.